Hello everyone. So welcome back. Uh, one of the most common encountered cases of dynamic loading on a structure is ground excitation due to an earthquake. And as a structural engineer, you will have to design structure to resist the earthquake forces generated by the ground shaking. So in today's class, we are going to learn how to set up the equation of motion of any structure okay subject to ground excitation and investigate further into that okay then we are going to look into a different type of loading which would demonstrate the difference between or which will demonstrate the effect of dynamic loading so we're going to talk about how to apply a pulse load so if a load p naught is suddenly applied then we will see what would be the dynamic effect on the structure okay and then we are going to solve some problems in which we are going to simplify our structure to a spring mass damper system and then solve for its response so we are going to start our uh, lecture today and uh, in today's lecture we are just going to be reviewing some of the concepts that we did in the last class and then we are going to be solving some problems here okay so let us start with uh, our uh, equation of motion that we uh, did last class in the last class we said that if we have let us say equation of motion as fd or fi plus fd plus fs equal to the applied force this was our equation of motion and we considered two representation the first representation was basically a frame representation this representation is better suited for uh, uh, people uh, with a structural engineering background and uh, what we assume that the whole mass of the frame is concentrated at a level okay and then under the action of an external load pt it actually deforms by deformation let us say uh, u okay and if it's a damped system then there was also damper connected in between so this was uh, the first representation and the same representation could also be understood using another representation we discussed which was basically a spring mass damper representation okay and a spring mass representation damper is more frequent like you know it's used more frequently in uh, mechanical vibration uh, subject okay or in physics okay so in this spring mass representation again i have the same mass m here the stiffness k damping coefficient c and under the action of this applied load here it undergoes a displacement u okay so these two representation we considered and if we had let us say a linear system so for a linear system we said that my spring force or the stiffness force would be simply k times u and a four linear damper it would be simply c times velocity so that i can write my equation of motion as mu double dot plus cu dot plus ku and that should be equal to p of t okay and this is a second order differential equation okay second order differential equation right okay so this was in general when there is a force p of t that was being applied on the structure now we also saw, uh, saw that if we had an earthquake excitation in which there was a ground so uh, for an earthquake excitation the same equation can be adapted to be written in a uh, different form so for an earthquake excitation okay, with ground acceleration represented by ugt and our displacement basically represented by ug 
a t here and the acceleration is usually double dot t so uh, we saw that the total displacement of the this frame that we had okay there would be a rigid component okay due to so uh, rigid motion of the body due to down displacement okay so this is ug of t okay and then there would be a further deformation due to the response of the structure so in this case it would be something like this okay so initially i had a mass here which finally shifted it here okay so this remember that this is ug of t here and then the displacement of the structure i am represented as uh, representing as u of t so the total displacement of the structure can be written as ground displacement plus the relative displacement of the uh, structure or the single degree of freedom representation of the structure okay and same would be the relationship if you uh, if you double differentiate it you would again get ug of double of t and then u double dot t okay so this is the representation now similarly if we consider the free body diagram of this remember that there is only fi fd and fs here there is no external force as such that we had at the top of the structure p of t okay and we said that for a uh, uh, inertial force is always due to total acceleration however the damping and the stiffness force is due to the deformation of the structure so the rigid body uh, motion which is basically ug of t which is the rigid offset that is not going to produce any uh, stiffness force in the structure because it does not produce any deformation in the structure okay similarly for the damping the damping is contributed by the uh, velocity in the structure with respect to its base and uh, for that representation you could only have uh, uh, velocity with uh, if the structure is deforming and undergoing a uh, let us say a velocity u dot okay so that's why we could write it as m of ug of t plus the relative acceleration and fd i can write it as c of u of t and then fss a of u of t and that should be equal to zero and i was able to write this this equation as reformulate it and write it as okay kut i will bring the ug double dot t on the right hand side and then write it as this term here which is basically the same as the equation that we uh, discussed earlier this equation okay or the equation here except there is a difference that now we have a p effective here which is represented by the mass of the structure structure times the ground acceleration and this is basically the earthquake force that acts on the structure so earthquake force on a structure is uh, acts opposite to the direction of the ground acceleration and it is mass times mass of the structure times the ground acceleration okay so just keep that in mind okay so the next step that comes that if, uh, if if i have a second order differential equation how do we solve it and uh, so if i have this equation of motion here let's again consider let me write that again how do i solve this so depending upon whether it is a free vibration okay a free vibration so a free for free vibration your pt is equal to 0 or whether it is an undamped system so for an undamped system your c is equal to 0 or a damped system okay c is not equal to 0 i could obtain different uh, solution or the value uh, basically the expression for u of t okay uh, and that we are going to do in the subsequent chapter when we are going to study free vibration and the response of undamped and the damped system uh, subject to periodic and non periodic loadings okay but what i want to show you here today is that through a simple example how a load that is applied suddenly or you can call it like you know dynamically how does it differ from the load that is applied statically and how would actually the response would differ okay so for example 
let me take an example here in this example i'm basically applying a step force in which the load p naught is applied okay but it is applied suddenly okay so i have this time variation of the load and then i need to find out what would be the response of the system so i am considering basically an undamped system so that my c is equal to 0 just for the sake of demonstration and i want to find out what is my uh, uh, basically the peak displacement now if you remember from your undergraduate classes uh, before if you were told that there is a force p naught in a spring that has a spring uh, constant as k the deformation it was said and i am going to represent it as u static it could be simply calculated as p naught by k correct now let us see if i apply this step force uh, suddenly uh, and then uh, if i have if i have available the time variation of the pt okay then i'm going to solve the equation of motion and then i'm going to see whether my dynamic response is any different from this value and how much actually is that difference okay so in this case i have given the force pt which is p naught for all time greater than or equal to 0 okay and my because it's an undamped system my equation of motion becomes mu triple dot plus ku is equal to pt which is here is p naught so my goal is to solve this equation okay and uh, we are going to come to uh, like you know in a few uh, subsequent chapters how do we solve this differential equation i just want to give an overview that how do we solve the second order differential equation okay so for a second order differential equation okay the total solution ut is represented by sum of a particular solution and then sum of complementary solution which is also called homogeneous solution okay so a particular solution is any any uh, solution that satisfies this equation okay so any solution that satisfies the equation your equation of motion can be used as a particular solution so for in this case i can directly look at that if i substitute up equal to p naught by k then the double differentiation of upt is actually uh, zero and then i get p naught equal to p naught so this could be used as a particular solution okay and then i have to find out complementary or homogeneous solution which is basically finding out the solution of this equation here okay k of uc of t equal to 0 so we set the right hand side equal to 0 and that's why we call it a homogeneous solution okay and then we try to find out the value of or the uh, expression for uc of t okay so in this case for this kind of differential equation i am going to assume my uc of t as e to the power lambda t okay and when i substitute in the above equation what do i get as m e to the power or let me write here, m lambda square because it's a double differential e to the power lambda t okay plus k e to the power lambda t okay so it should be m lambda square plus k equal to 0 okay now i know that this term cannot be equal to 0 it does not give me any feasible solution so what i am left with is this expression here if i equate that to 0 i get lambda as plus minus under root minus k by m which can be further written as plus minus i to represent the under root minus 1 and this one i'll write it as k by m again i will write as this minus i omega n omega n is basically uh, the natural frequency of uh, the system that you are considering we are going to come back to that in a later chapter just right now you uh, like you know it interpret as any other constant through which i am representing this quantity under root a by m 
okay so i have two roots here lambda 1 which is i omega n and uh, and the lambda 2 which is minus i omega n okay so if i have two roots the solution of this complementary uh, uh, this equation right here okay can be written as a linear combination of both uh, roots okay so i would write that as remember that i had assumed this has to be the solution so linear combination of the two solution a e to the power lambda 1t and b e to the power lambda 2t okay which would nothing but e a e to the power i omega n t plus b e to the power minus i omega n t okay and i also remember from my knowledge of complex number that i can write e i to the power i x equal to cos x plus i sin x and if i replace i i x by minus x i can write this e to the power minus x as again cos x minus i sin x okay so i'll do that here okay and then rearrange the terms to obtain a plus b cos omega and t plus i a minus b sin omega and t okay so this and this so these two are unknown coefficients that i need to find out i am going to represent them with two unknown coefficients here and i can write it as at c cos omega and t plus d sin omega and t okay so this is the complementary or the homogeneous solution so the total solution of the initial differential equation i can write it as u particular plus u complementary okay and this would be p not by k plus c cos omega n t plus d sin omega n t now you see that we consider a second order differential equation and now we have two unknown constants so we need two conditions to actually find out the specific solution to our differential equation okay and where those two conditions are going to come from well it comes from the initial conditions for a dynamic uh, problem okay so the initial conditions in a uh, equation of motion would be your initial velocity and initial displace uh, sorry initial displacement and initial velocity okay and in this case because it is given that initially like you know they were at rest suddenly a force is applied so i can assume i can assume that u0 and u.0 both to be equal to 0 okay for my case okay so you can substitute that in this equation here to obtain the value of the co uh, constant c and d okay and you will see that okay you will get the final solution as p naught by k 1 minus cos omega n t right so this is the solution that i have okay due to the step force that is being applied to my single degree of freedom system so let me just write it again here or redraw it again so i have pt here and then i have t here and this is p naught now remember had it been a static problem then my u static would, would have been just p naught by k so if this is my u of t and so this is the response this is the applied force and this is the response for a static problem i would have this uh, displacement as p naught by k but i can see that my dynamic displacement actually is not p naught by k but it actually fluctuates due to time variation of cos of omega and t and if you try to plot that it would look like something like at t equal to 0 your displacement is 0 okay and at t equal to let us say pi what you will find your displacement is actually minus uh, this term would be minus 1 so that you will get 2 p naught by k okay so if i draw this is a time displacement this value here is 2 p naught by k which is the maximum dynamic displacement 
okay, which would occur when cos omega nt is minus 1. So I can write u max is equal to 2p0 by k, okay, which is 2 times the u static that I had determined, okay. So you can see that if I had applied the load P0 statically or for a static problem, I would get a displacement which is equal to P0 by K. However, if I apply the same load suddenly like a step force, then I'm getting a peak displacement which is two times the static displacement. Okay, so this is the effect of the uh, structural dynamics that is coming into the play here. Okay, and this too is as you would study later it is called dynamic amplification of the response and there are different factors to define it okay so this example was just to demonstrate that if a load p0 is applied statically or if it is applied dynamically then your response are actually or the peak responses are actually different and for this specific case it was two times the static uh, displacement okay so I hope this problem will give you a better idea of what uh, the dynamic nature of problem could do to the response of a single degree of freedom system. Okay. All right. If that is clear to you, what we are going to do now, we are going to do or uh, solve some examples related to uh, these type of equation of motion. Okay. So and then see how do we tackle different problems okay so in example one here what do i have here is actually a slab okay a slab that is supported on four columns okay so these are the slabs that are supported on four columns okay and the dimension of uh, these uh, this slab is b in this direction and b along this direction okay and it is given that these four columns with respect to these axes x and y have stiffnesses kx the lateral stiffnesses kx and the lateral stiffness ky in the two perpendicular direction so each of these uh, columns uh, would have uh, these uh, stiffnesses in two uh, direction okay and what do you need to do for a small angular deformation of the slab in plane angular deformation so let us say slab is actually rotating okay like this in plane you need to set up the equation of motion for this slab here all right so i would like you to uh, pause this and then try to solve this problem all right let us discuss the solution of this problem okay so let us consider the top view of this slab that I have here. Okay, slab, let me just uh, draw it like this. Okay, so this is the slab that I have. And if I rotate it, if it has an angular uh, rotation, uh, let me again uh, draw the deflected uh, position of the slab, which would be, let me just redraw it here. Okay, would be something like, something like this okay sorry for the, the bad drawing but uh, let i mean uh, figuratively like you know it just does the uh, job okay so what is happening here it is rotating by theta here okay so that at all points it is rotating by theta with respect to its original position okay now remember as it rotates okay at any corner the horizontal displacement is the same displacement that i have here which is represented by the half of this length which is d by 2 okay times the angle so this displacement horizontal displacement is d by 2 theta similarly the vertical displacement at this point is nothing but the half of this length which is b by 2 times this angular displacement which is b by 2 times theta and same would be the displacement at all the four corners okay and like you know if you want you can do the same thing you can derive the same thing by considering the angular displacement by plotting a line and then doing it like this 
Now, okay, this is just a simple way of a simple way of considering that whatever the horizontal displacement at this point, okay, at this point here would be the same horizontal displacement at this point. And the vertical displacement of this point would be the vertical uh, displacement of uh, the uh, slab at uh, horizontal position. Okay. Now, if when it tries to rotate it like that, what will happen? This there the column would apply a force in this direction, which would be kx times the horizontal displacement, which is d by 2 theta, and in this direction, which would be okay, ky times b by 2 times theta, and same would be the case at other uh, corners as well. For example, here it would apply in this direction, okay and in this direction okay and at this point it is going to apply in this direction and in this direction and at this point it is going to apply in this direction and in this direction and the one thing that is common that at each corner each pair of these forces are actually creating clockwise moment about this point the center of this slab so if i want to set up the equation of motion uh, I need to sum up the moment due to all these forces that are being applied by the column on the slab at, the, uh, at all of its uh, corners and then there is another force or the moment basically the inertial moment due to rotation of the slab which would be opposite to the direction of rotation and it would be i times theta double dot. So I can simply write it as i times theta double dot and then take the moment of these uh, column uh, forces that are being applied on the slab. So it would be first force would be kx times d by 2 times theta and the moment of this force about the center would be again d by 2 plus ky b by 2 times theta and the moment about center would be uh, multiplying would be obtained by multiplying with the lever arm b by 2 and this times 4 as you can see uh, it is uh, producing the same moment at all the four corners so i will multiply it with four to get the final equation okay so i can write it as final equation of motion as kx d square plus ky b square times theta equal to zero okay so this is my final uh, equation of uh, motion for this given problem okay all right once that is clear let us discuss another example okay example 2 here in this example what do i have i actually have a rigid bar here okay so let me uh, draw a rigid bar okay it is connected to a pin connection pin support at one third of its length okay and there are three springs each of stiffness k okay connected to this rigid bar at length l by 3 l by 3 and l by 3 from each other okay and what i need to do again is to set up the equation of motion for an angular rotation of this bar okay and the mass of the bar is m and as i said the total length is l Okay, so take some time and solve this problem. Okay, let us discuss the solution uh, to this problem. Okay, first let me say, let me uh, draw the initial position and the default position for an angular rotation. So let us say it rotates in uh, clockwise direction by an angle theta. So let us say the rotation is in this direction by angle theta. Okay, due to this rotation, the springs at the leftmost end would be stretched by a, uh, by a deformation uh, and I can find that out as uh, L by 3 times theta and this uh, second spring is going to compress by L by 3 times theta and the third spring would be 2L by 3 times theta. Okay, So in terms of forces this spring is going to apply a downward force and these two springs are going to apply upward forces like this. Okay, and if you consider the free body diagram, due to clockwise rotation, there would be an inertial movement which would be applied anti clockwise. Okay, and that would be 
the i of this or the moment of inertia of this rod about the point of rotation times theta double dot okay so if i take an moment of all these forces and equate it to zero about the point of rotation o which is the pin support okay let us see what do i get i get i theta double dot plus the moment of this force all these three forces spring forces are in the same direction the counter clockwise direction okay so it would be k l by 3 which is the spring force times the lever arm about the point of rotation is l by 3 okay again for the second spring k l by 3 times theta times l by 3 and then the, the rightmost spring would be k 2 l by 3 times theta into 2 l by 3 and that should be equal to 0 okay now the i of this bar about its about the point of rotation would be i of this bar about its center of mass plus the mass of the bar times the distance of the point of rotation from the center of mass which i can calculate as this okay and this i can write it as ml square by 12 and this as ml square by 36 which eventually gives me ml square by 9 okay so i'll substitute that here ml square by 9 plus this i would get as 6 kl square by 9 times theta equal to 0 there is another uh, theta double dot term here okay so the final equation of motion would be ml square or i can just uh, divide that and i can write it as theta double dot plus 6k divided by m times theta equal to 0 so this is the final equation of motion for this uh, system uh, that is uh, shown here okay all right let us go ahead and do example 3 So in example 3, what do I have? It's not a very difficult problem, but I just want to demonstrate you the concept of uh, rotation and twisting. Okay. So in this case, what do I have? I have a thin shaft here, okay, which is rigidly connected to a disc. Okay. The polar moment of inertia of this shaft, okay, can be calculated from its diameter d. The radius of this disc is r. Okay, the mass of this disc is m. Okay, the shear modulus of this shaft is actually g. Okay, let me see. Do you need anything else? Yeah, you need the length of this shaft. Now, can you imagine if I try to provide twist to this disc? Okay, what is going to happen? Remember that disc in its own plane is very rigid compared to the twisting stiffness of the shaft. So the, all the twisting is going to happen in the shaft and if you remember if I have two spring in series let's say k1 and k2 okay where let us say k1 is less less than k2 so k equivalent is actually decided by the whatever the most flexible spring is in this case it would be approximately k1 okay and that you can find out from the expression 1 by k1 plus 1 by k2 right if k1 is very very uh, small than k2 this quantity would be very very large to this quantity so that you can neglect it so that when you invert it k equivalent becomes equal to k1 okay so in this case uh, disc own stiffness uh, torsional stiffness is much higher than the shaft stiffness okay and that's why i'm just going to consider the whole resistance is coming from the shaft and if you remember from your solid mechanics class if I have, I have a shaft of length L okay and then uh, shear modulus G and polar moment of inertia J okay and if I apply a twisting moment on this shaft okay the relationship between this twisting moment and the twist in this shaft so if I project it here let us say this is uh, deforming by theta this I can write it as J G by L times theta, which is the basically the rotational uh, stiffness or the twisting stiffness of this shaft right here. 
okay so if you consider the free body diagram of this disc and then assume that it is rotating by theta remember the same would be the rotation in the shaft okay so shaft is going to apply an equal and opposite moment which i have here which would be m of this shaft let us say it is ms okay and because i am rotating it by theta what will happen i need to again include in the free body diagram a rotational inertia okay which would be whatever the mass moment of inertia of this disc times theta double dot okay so if i take moment of all the forces about center i can write it as i theta double dot plus ms that should be equal to zero and i know that my ms is this okay so i write it as m r square by 2 okay plus j g by l times theta that should be equal to zero and if you remember the polar moment to inertia of a shaft is given by the formula pi d4 by 32 okay so that you can use here all right so this was our third example okay let us go through another example which is example four here okay and in this example what do i have i have two concentric disks which are rigidly connected to each other okay so i'm going to draw the uh, figure here and there is a string which is connected to this internal disk and there is a mass hanging from this disk okay and there is a spring connected to the outer disk and then the stiffness of this uh, spring is k the internal radius is r and the external radius is 2r the mass here is m okay so you need to set up the equation of motion for this system okay so uh, pause the video here and then take some time to attempt this problem and see what do you get as final answer okay all right let us discuss the problem okay now for this uh, setup that i have here let us consider the motion from the initial equilibrium position remember it is not the undefined position but the equilibrium position that i'm considering all right and if you remember gravity load need not to be considered if i'm considering the motion from the equilibrium position and if initially the gravity load was being balanced by a, a spring okay deformation in the spring which is the case here so i don't need to consider that uh, uh, gravity load in the equation of motion or the free body diagram okay so if i consider the free body diagram of the mass here okay all right what are the forces acting on this mass mass the mass is going down so there would be inertial force which is acting upwards which would be mu double dot and then there is a tension in this string here all right and i'm uh, saying that this is coming down by u now can i say if this string comes down by u okay the circumferential rotation of this inner disc would also be u so that the angular rotation of the inner disc okay so i'm saying that it is coming here by u okay so that this theta that i get okay would be how much okay this theta would be u divided by the inner uh, radius of the inner disc okay which is r okay and same would be the rotation of the outer disc as well however the circumferential rotation uh, distance would be actually 2r times theta which if i substitute the value of theta it would be 2u and the same would be the extension in this spring here okay so the force in the spring would be actually k times 2 u okay which is the deformation in the string and that would be the force that would be applied on this outer disc by this spring so if i consider the free body diagram of the whole uh, disc arrangement okay i would have force 2 k u acting here i have force t which is acting here okay and remember that these discs do not have any mass uh, themselves okay so if i take the moment of all the forces about the center of the disc i get t times r is equal to 2 ku times 2r so that gives me t as 4 ku so now i know that 
what is my uh, force in the string i can write down the equation of motion of this mass okay which would be nothing but mu double dot plus t and that should be equal to 0 which i can write it as mu double dot plus 4 au and that should be equal to 0 all right okay now let us see our example 5 in example 5 i again have a spring mass system except in this case okay uh, i do not have a block but i have a rotational disk here okay and i need to find out what is the equation of motion if there is rolling without slipping okay so if that is the condition and these constants are given to you okay the radius is basically r here you need to find the equation of motion of this system here all right okay so take some time and then try to attempt this problem so that we are going to come back to again this later and then solve it all right